how to generalize uh, these discrete um, facts to general spaces. So afterwards, so after part one, I try to go through again and look what we can do at each step that everything works also on much more general spaces. Okay, let's start. So uh, one definition you already uh, see here uh, today uh, um, is the definition of Markov processes and stochastic duality. So you see here, uh, I just re um, repeated because it's the main ingredient of, of uh, the today um, of today. So you see, we have two Markov processes. I call them X and Y, and um, duality function mapping um, elements X Y to R is called duality function if that equation holds. So on the one side we fix X uh, or we fix Y and let X T evolve, and on the other side it's completely the other way around. And if that equation holds, then we say uh, they are dual. Um, one other little notation, uh, which I also like very much, is the notation with, uh, with semigroups. So Markov semigroup, uh, I think you know it, what it, what it is. Um, you can also write it like that. And uh, in Giara's presentation, you already saw some um, characterization with generators. That is simply done by uh, taking the derivative uh, with respect to T of that line, um, yes. So in my presentation, um, I consider self-duality. That means simply that X is equal to Y. So we only have one Markov process. Okay, um, let's start with an example, um, namely the symmetric inclusion process. Just to recall what it was. So that is the generator. Maybe I draw a little picture just to make sure that everybody knows what I mean. So you have some discrete set. Here I wrote it down for even finiteness um, of E that doesn't really make a difference. So let's say these are points, one, two, three, four, five. And um, our configuration space describes how many particles are at each position, let's say here are three, here are two, here are one, and here is no point. And then you can see from the generator that is here what is red, that um, for example, a particle jumps from position one to position two, uh, that is with rate alpha two plus in that case two. So you see it's more likely if there are a lot of um, particles at position two, then it's more likely um, that a particle jumps to there. But also if, for example, alpha four is uh, strictly positive, then there's also some probability that a particle jumps to there, even if there are no particles. Okay, um, yeah, here are some conductances. I just uh, set them on one on that um, example uh, I wrote on the blackboard. And yes, and then you can uh, think about some uh, reversible measures. And here it is well known that a product of negative binomial distributions uh, is reversible. So here the product is uh, over the points. So you see, for example, for that example, you have uh, the product of five negative binomial distributions for one fixed P. So we have a family of reversible measures parameter parameterized by P. P is in between zero and one. And these alpha k's are exactly chosen uh, like these alpha l's in the definition of, of L. Okay, so that's the symmetric inclusion process. And um, yeah, what I can also quickly do, so you see here, so that um, in red brackets, so it's now alpha l plus xl. That's the SIP. Then I can also look to alpha L minus XL. If I assume that these are integers, then uh, that generator describes the symmetric exclusion process. And I can also just only write alpha L and that uh, then these are independent random walkers. Okay, uh, just for your information. And yes, and these two examples uh, are very similar to, to the SIP. And you see, uh, it's also well known that for the independent random walkers, 
a product of Poisson distributions are reversible. Poisson here means Poisson with respect to these alpha Ls. And the same is for the symmetric exclusion process here. Also, we have the product structure. Um, in that case, a product of binomial distributions uh, where these alpha Ls, which are describing the capacity of each point, is then the parameter of the binomial distribution. And so far, uh, you have whatever graphs in UAB. I mean, the conductance is a positive a priori for any two points. Yeah, so we have to use conductances is CKL, and it does, doesn't matter uh, when, when considering reversible meshes. Yes? Yes. Yes, so these alpha L are just numbers. So they are just uh, parameters of the model. Okay, um, here one little theorem, which I want later to generalize. Um, it's from Karinci, Giardina, and uh, Redig. And it's just so if you, if you denote rho um, by a rho the reversible measure, then that function here, defined like that, it turns out that this is um, a self-duality function. And the main ingredient here, so that one over rho of x is just uh, one co uh, a leading constant. It's not very important. So the, uh, the same as the, the one over the factorial, but the main ingredient is that brackets yk and then subscript xk. And what that means is the so-called falling factorial. So just write it down again. Um, and I want to say something about it. So um, for a, a fixed k, you see that is a polynomial of degree k. So on the right side, you see we have a polynomial, especially of degree xk in that case. Uh, and the variable we put inside is yk. So you see we have a polynomial on the right side in total uh, of degree, the sum of the xk's. That will be later important. Um, yes, OK. And. Um, Similarly, so here on the right side, you saw the polynomials um, of degree k. One can also think about what happens if I orthogonalize them. And here's also a very nice result from uh, um, Hans Kien and Giardina. And you see, if I replace, so these, these slides are very similar. You see, here put in, in the polynomial yk of degree xk. And here it's the same. I put in a polynomial m. I say later what it is, yk of degree xk. So it's really the same structure. And what are these mn? Uh, these are orthogonal polynomials with respect to the reversible measure. In our case, the reversible measure of the zip, so I'm just doing everything for the zip, was uh, the negative binomial distribution. And it's well known that Meixner polynomials are reversible with respect to these. And what you can do then is um, you, you, you form the product, forming a product of Meixner polynomials where you put in each yk means we do more or less just the multivariate orthogonal polynomial. And here's the theorem. It's indeed a self-duality function. OK, um, questions so far? Maybe a comment? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is, I think, the orthogonal one. So you can rephrase these Meixner polynomials in terms of uh, generalized um, hypergeometric function. And these, um, so you see that these constants here before, if you put them together with the Meixner polynomials, you get indeed exactly the generalized hypergeometric functions. So it's just a little bit rewritten, rewritten. Uh, for our purpose, but thank you for the for the hint. One other little comment: um, there's a property called consistency, so we are still in the discrete. 
Um, consistency roughly means, I can just say it with words, that the action of removing a particle commutes with the dynamics. So what does, does that mean? We start, for example, with five particles. Then we remove, at first, a particle uniformly at random. So we have four. Then we can let evolve the dynamics. Then we, so we have a distribution of four particles. And we can also do it the other way around. So we start with the same five particles. Then we let evolve the dynamics with five particles. And then afterwards, we remove one particle uniformly at random. And um, that property we call consistency. Maybe one remark, I also talk about that later. Um, in Jan Swart's uh, presentation, there was also uh, a name consistency. That means almost the same with the difference that here, removing a particle uniformly at random. And in the other consistency, it was we remove a fixed particle. So that's the only difference, but we see that later uh, when we look to examples. So when giving that some, some um, formal structure, we can formulate that property by a commuting relation of operators, namely PT denotes the dynamics and A, so some uh, annihilation operator, we also saw some annihilation operators today. Uh, I'd rather call it lowering operator, but it doesn't matter. Um, just commutes and Here's also some probabilistic uh, point of view on that equation if somebody is interested. And the motivation why we do that um, notation is that theorem here, it says for reversible particle systems on discrete set, duality or self-duality is equivalent to consistency. So it turns out that consistency is really a good starting point when considering duality. Okay, um, that was well, until now everything well known. Everything was on the discrete world. And now my research is uh, coming. Namely, the question is so you saw here we are looking to discrete points. And we just want to uh, remove that assumption and replace that E, for example, by R. So the particles are not living anymore on a discrete set, but on a much more general set. For example, the real numbers. One remark, um, indeed, it's, it's uh, not at all important that these are the real numbers. So one can choose, indeed, some arbitrary borrow space. So a very general space, for example, a Banner space, Hilbert space, about whatever you are thinking about, but especially also the discrete. So and it, it turns out later, we will see, see that, that the new theory I present here is indeed the generalization of everything known from the discrete. So putting E to be discrete gives exactly the same results. And you see um, in my first um, 15 minutes, I presented some results. And when um, doing that in the continuum, some challenges appear. And I summarized them and I also wrote them on the blackboard just that you can read what we are doing. So. One challenge, for example, is the configuration space. So in that example, we had that one here. Let's say these are, or just write five. Uh, the first question would be how to model the configuration. Then a second question would be, are there models? <laughs> so it, it, it sounds strange, but the question is not trivial. Then a next step is, Consistency. So we saw that there's some notation of consistency. Is there also some similar notation for the continuum work? Then we had duality function. Then the question is, is that the right concept? Is there something even better? Then we have the falling factorials here. You see, um, putting them in the continuum is also maybe not very easy. Then reversible meshes. You saw we have a product measure over the sides. That maybe also doesn't really make sense or is not clear at, at the beginning. And finally, we have orthogonal polynomials. It's also not really clear what it should be uh, in a very general world. And here in the, at the end, if, if time allows, I also want to um, stress some further challenges, but we see if uh, time allows. Okay, what is the main idea of everything? 
So the main idea is exactly that consistency. So consistency, so that property that removing a particle uniformly at random commutes with the dynamic turns out to be very easy uh, formulated in a continuum. So you see when I explain it by words, it's also definitely makes sense in a continuum. And it turns out when I define consistency in the right way, that is a perfect starting point to get later dualities for the continuum. So that is the main idea. One simply start by that consistency. Okay, um, then configurations. That challenge turns out, turns out not to be too hard. So you see here, we have, um, um, so for example, that configuration here gives three, two, one, zero, zero. And how to encode, for example, here's are the real numbers. How to, if, you, if I say here are, for example, two points, let's say 2.7, or here's pi. So how to, how to uh, write down that configuration? That can be done by using meshes, namely counting meshes. And uh, that notation uh, can be found in, in the modern notation of point processes. So if you know, so I think most of the people here. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So for for each initial configuration, that property should hold. Yes. So um, yeah, I can. So maybe just to to sum it up. So let's do it in the discrete. So that operator here was defined as that. Let's write it like that. And you see if I write down that property, you see that should hold for each function and each X. And for each X means for each starting configuration. Okay, uh, thank you for the remark. So coming back here, so uh, I think most of the people uh, here know the book of uh, Lars Penrose, uh, Poisson Processes. And here's the notation of um, counting meshes introduced. And you see, for example, that configuration here, I can write it down in terms of meshes. So that is 2.7, Dirac measure there, times two, plus three times delta. Pi. Okay, uh, and it turns out that that is a suitable uh, way to write down configurations. Okay, uh, then, so here can I, I can say check. Okay, then uh, the question, are there models? And it turns out that there is some generalized version of our SIP also for the continuum. Um, it's more or less uh, our invention, but uh, here it is. So what we should do, we take some C, these replace the conductances, that is now a symmetric function, also measurable, and should be non-negative. And instead of these alpha, we take a finite measure. And that is now the generator. So for example, if we are in that um, setting here, you see there's a probability that a particle jumps from here to there at rate three, but there's an ad a, a additional force, namely that alpha, which says to each other arbitrary point, the point jumps with rate uh, or with distribution alpha divided by alpha total mass um, and rate alpha of r. Okay, and there's some nice uh, interpretation which, which could, could be done uh, for uh, population genetics, namely if you think about that these realigned are different types of a species, then you can think about um, that you have two forces. And one force means, so if you jump to a known species, that is that 
eater here. And if you jump to a new one, that could be encode some mutation. So that is some nice uh, interpretation you could uh, give on this model. Um, yes, so that is some generalized version of the SIP. Um, there are also some other models. If you look, for example, to these independent random walkers, um, it turns out you can take an arbitrary Markov process, whatever you want, and then just um, let evolve independent copies of them. Yes, so that is also a model. And um, one other model you can also look at are these strongly consistent systems. That these are the consistent systems of yesterday. Let's say it like that. Uh, and here, for example, um, here's some sticky missing, I see. So sticky Brownian motions or some correlated Brownian motion. I think they are also, were also mentioned yesterday. And I think that question is not trivial. <laughs> so I think it depends maybe. So how, how you formulated the question. So because um, the strong consistent, you need a labeled notation. So you have to formulate what it means of removing um, a fixed particle. But in that notation here, that doesn't really make sense, that question, because you don't know what is the fixed particle. So you, you don't have labels. So the question is rather, is there a labeled version of the GSIP which is strongly consistent? And I have never thought about that. Um, maybe yes. I would rather say yes, but I don't know. Okay, um, and it turns out that these models here, so why exactly these models? That these they are consistent with the generalized version of the notation of consistency. Okay. Consistency, um, what you should do is you should just generalize that operator here. That can be done very easily. So you can just copy that here and uh, replacing the sum by an integral. And that XK simply means you integrate with respect to eta. And then you can formulate what means uh, consistency is just the same commutation property. So as I said, uh, consistency is a good starting point to, uh, to dive into the world of generalized um, dualities. And in, the, in particular, the, that GSIP is consistent. And also, all these models here. So, for all these models here, you can see uh, that they are consistent. So, for strongly consistent, as the name says, um, it's just a stronger form. For independent Markov processes, it's more or less trivial. And for the generalized zip, it's a computation. <laughs> Let's say it like that. Okay. Um, then maybe some some other little uh, computation or some some other little remark. Um, what do I mean by intertwiner? So intertwiner is included in the title of that presentation. Um, the intertwiner is more or less just for, so at least for me, it's just an operator that commutes with PT. And um, what I want to say now, starting from a duality function, you can lift it to an operator just by defining. So you start with uh, the duality function. So we are back in the discrete, sorry. Uh, and we, what we define is some kernel operator. Um, so having a function f, we integrate it with respect to rho. Rho is an reversible measure. And uh, we have some kernel function, namely the duality function. And if we define that operator, that operator then commutes with the T. That is a very um, easy uh, computation, yeah? So H is also a valid function. Yes, yeah, so okay. that, mm -hmm. that is just an example. So if we are back to the discrete, we have a duality, self-duality function, and we have a reversible measure. And we define an operator like that then you can see it intertwines PT with itself. And that commutation relation is very easy to see. I'm not sure if time allows, if I do that. Depends on how much later you need it after. I mean, if you finish a bit later. Yeah, maybe I do it later if you have time. So let's see. Um, okay, so um, what we see here, if we are in the discrete, 
have a duality function, then we can lift it to an operator that commutes with PT. And that is the, also one main ingredient for our generalized theory. Um, let's do some, some example. So for example, that duality function here uh, in, in terms of falling factorials, if, we, if, we, uh, if I compute that operator, so that's just the definition, and then I put it in, then it looks like that here. It's just a straightforward computation. And maybe one example, so we are still in the discrete. So if I say fx1 um, to xn, we put that special function. So we put the indicator function, which says only that configuration um, should be, the function should be one, namely here d1 to dn. Then you see if I put it in, in into f, we obtain, so it's now tf of y, Okay, uh, just an example, what you can do. Okay, um, the same can be done for uh, orthogonal polynomials. Then uh, if I put in, for example, that special function, you see it's almost the same. We just get d1 factorial p d1 Okay, um, so maybe I changed up uh, P and M. <laughs> so whenever P appears, it should be an M. <laughs> okay, um, yes, uh, and one other example. So uh, whenever you have a reversible measure, which has uh, non-zero values, then you can define some cheap duality function um, just by putting that as a function. And you only use the reversible uh, reversibility to prove that that is a self-duality function. It's often a good starting point finding dualities. And if I compute here the operator T, you get simply the identity operator. So here you see it's very trivial. Um, so, or the cheap duality function is very trivial because the corresponding intertwiner is just the identity operator. So that gives a, a round picture of the cheap duality function. Okay, uh, so we saw Given duality functions, we can define this operator, uh, operator T. And um, that I can skip, that's not so important. Um, and the idea is um, these operators T, when I define them, they can be very easily generalized also in a continuum. But it is not possible to generalize the duality functions. And uh, you can see that, for example, uh, if I go back, uh, here, if you have the cheap duality function, that function doesn't make sense in a continuum because then uh, most of the reversible meshes are absolutely continuous and, and so on. So in the, in the, in the general, generalized uh, world, that fraction doesn't make sense. But you see the identity operators makes definitely sense. So identity operators, I can write down every, them uh, every time. So, so Especially at that example, you can see intertwiners are maybe the more elegant way to generalize uh, duality functions. Um, yes, already said that. Okay, um, now we uh, have some of the main ingredients, so we know what an intertwiner means. But of course, we now have to generalize the falling factorials for our examples. And here it turns out. The generalization already exists. That is the so-called Leonard's k-transform. Um, how is it defined? So if you have a function, then you are looking to the sum of each configuration consisting of the same points or you remove particles. Um, here I put a little hat on that symbol because you have to be a little bit careful. Um, so for example, if eta consists of different points, 
then it's, it's exactly what I said. But for example, if I have that special configuration here, you have to count delta x two times. So one time I remove the first, and one time I remove the other. So for that, I use that these, uh, that other notation. Um, yes, as I said, that object already exists. And you can also rephrase it uh, in terms of um, calling factorials. So that uh, sum here becomes a series, which says we put in n particles, which are to, uh, taken from eta and, um, and uh, an additional series and n factorial. And it's some con combinatoric um, consideration that you can see that it's the same. That uh, falling factorial mesh, I think it was also uh, already contained in some, some presentation. Um, so maybe to see that is really analog to, to, to that um, line. So if I have eta n d x1 to xn, I can write it as eta dx1 minus x1 Okay, so uh, when I write down some, some uh, representation of these falling factorials, you, you see it's really the same structure. Here's that eta, then I uh, subtract one that is uh, replaced by uh, I subtract uh, a point at uh, x1 and so on. Okay, um, and here's our theorem. If you have some consistent system, for example, the SIP or the GSIP, then we have that intertwining relation. Okay, um, yeah, so it's, it's very short to formulate it. Um, one can also formulate it, uh, so you see we have here a series. One can simply uh, choose that F with support on N particles. Uh, then you get an equation like that. For that, you need that um, the, the process conserves the number of particles. That was fulfilled for all examples I mentioned in that, um, presentation yet. And then you can see an equation like that. So on the left side, you first let evolve eta with arbitrary particles, then having the intertwiner. And on the other side, I have first the intertwiner, and then I, I let evolve n particles. So to, to, to summarize that, we have an intertwining between almost infinitely many particles, so as, as much you want, and n particles. So you can reduce, you reduce problems from a lot of particles to just n particles. And that could be very useful. And uh, what else is interesting, um, only consistency is needed. So um, we use nothing else from the GSIP. So um, that's also a nice fact. OK, um, so far so good. And now I want to explain uh, very briefly that that operator K is the same as the operator T at the beginning. So we had that T here. So that was a known duality function. Then we put that T. That in the discrete world, that T coincides with K. And you see, so uh, if I put in here, that's a special function in that K. Oh, sorry for jumping around. Um, so if you have that K put in a special function, namely that I wrote down here, then it's some combinatorical consideration and you get indeed exactly the same, namely that here. Yes. So this operator K doesn't happen to be uh, to correspond to a probability kernel, right? The, not a probability kernel, but a kernel. So you can see if I, if I look to that representation, you have an integration. Yes. So it's a an kernel operator with a, a non-negative measure, but it's not possible if you have the reversible measure to write it as an integral with respect to a function integrated uh, multiplied by F d rho of X. So that is the reason why you use intertwiners.
Okay. Um, okay. Uh, maybe have a little bit to hurry up. So um, yes, we can make some. And so we already did that. And uh, in the end, so we also want to have some orthogonal dualities. One observation, one motivation. So that rho alpha p, if that denotes the product measure of negative binomial distributions, and I define some xd, which simply sums up only the xk's contained uh, or with that k in d, then you can see, so we have the convolution property of the negative binomial distribution that it just convolute uh, up to also again a negative binomial distribution where here the sum is and the fixed p. And you can see if I have some disjoint sets, these are independent. So that's very trivial, but that gives the motivation how to define the reversible measure for uh, the generalized world. So we are looking to a measure rho on the configuration space. So the configuration space uh, was the set of counting measures. So if you have a measure, for example, a probability measure on that set, um, some other interpretation gives, that is the distribution of a point process. And um, if you look to these two properties here, um, at least the second property uh, you see looks similar to the Poisson process. And the first property also looks similar if you replace the Poisson process by the negative binomial distribution. Um, so the question is, is there a point process with these two properties? So if I put in um, disjoint sets, I get independent random variables. And if I put in a fixed set, do I get negative binomial distribution? And the answer is yes, that's the so-called called Pascal process. Does anybody know the Pascal process? Okay, um, that's good because then I can introduce it. Um, so you have here these two, two axioms and you can also prove, yes, it exists. And uh, there's even much more general theory, namely the theory of Levy processes on general spaces, for example, manifolds. And you can replace here the negative binomial by an other arbitrary infinite uh, divisible um, measure. Um, good, and, and it turns out that the distribution of the Pascal process is indeed reversible for the G-slip. Okay, so reversible measure, we did it. And then finally, yes. Yeah, so you see you have parameter P and alpha. So it depends how you define it. Let's uh, you should be a little bit careful because uh, everybody defines it differently. So uh, you have to define a negative binomial distribution that there's also mass on zero and uh, then it should work. Yeah. So and you have a parameter P and alpha. And if you um, convolute negative binomial distribution P alpha one and P alpha two, then it gets P alpha one plus two alpha two. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so something about uh, infinite dimensional polynomials, that is the last point. So what we have to define is uh, uh, and, um, a good way to formulate orthogonal polynomials in infinite dimensions. And there's also theory, and that can be done on that way. So we define a polynomial as a mapping, mapping a configuration, to a real number, namely the integral of the product measure with respect to a function. And that function here can be seen as a coefficient. Um, and the polynomials, so that should be a monomial of degree n. And the poly polynomials of degree less or equal than n are then just the linear combinations of all choices of um, f, fk. Uh, one example that you can see that's uh, really a polynomial so let's go back to the, to the discrete world or to the finite world. Um, a configuration can be written like that. So you have x1 to xn particles at position 1 to n. And if I now put, uh, if I write it down, you can see here appear these x and some coefficients. So it's definitely a polynomial. 
And one further example, if I want to reproduce, for example, that x1 to the power of n, which is obviously a polynomial, um, I can choose the coefficient to be just one if all L1 to Ln are equal to one. And then if you integrate it, you simply see it's x1 to the power of n. So that notation definitely recovers all the um, polynomials of the uh, discrete world. Okay, and uh, finally, so we have polynomials defined. We also need orthogonal polynomials. Uh, what we can do, we are going to L2, to the L2 space with respect to rho. So rho is the reversible measure. And um, what we can do now, uh, here's that monomial. We can project it on the complement or on the, on the um, orthogonal complement of Pn minus one. So we project everything away which uh, has lower degree. And uh, that polynomial I denote by I and Fn. So it turns out even in the discrete world, the orthogonal polynomials can be constructed like that. And of course, you should, you should assume that some moment exists that the polynomials are in L2. And these orthogonal, orthogonal poly, uh, polynomials, um, also there's a lot of literature about that. That is infinite dimensional analysis. Uh, especially Litvinov did a lot of uh, literature about that. And there's also some link, uh, if you go, for example, um, if rho is the distribution of a Poisson process, then that INFN is uh, our multiple stochastic integrals, uh, especially multiple Wiener Ito integrals. And there's also a lot of um, literature about chaos decomposition, Fox spaces. So that is a well-known object. And finally, okay, that I can skip. Um, finally, um, here's uh, our main theorem. One can generalize the orthogonal polynomials to be intertwiners in that sense. Um, let's do it like that first. So um, let's say it's conservative. Then I can define some semi-group um, describing n particles. So that was the second property of the first intertwining relation. Uh, then you have that equation. So you see we have an intertwining of arbitrary many particles with n particles. And then similarly to the K-transform, I can mix up this i and fn to a, to a series. And then I get um, that that is intertwiner of pt with itself and um, that theorem is true for all consistent conservative and reversible systems so also not only for the gsip and it turns out that um, in the discrete world that operator here so that operator there that t is indeed the same operator so we definitely recover all known orthogonal dualities from the discrete Okay, um, yes, I think I skipped that. <laughs> Good, so if there are no questions, thank you for listening. <laughs>